Hello and welcome to episode 23, Navigating the Spectrum, Multilateralism, Satellite Communication and Political Leadership in the Indo-Pacific. We have had several guests in the previous episode who actually spoke about Indo-Pacific, uh, but we really didn't took a deep dive into this topic. Uh, but in today's episode, we'll be also taking a deep dive into the Indo-Pacific as well as looking at the region from a much more security aspect as well as from the space industry's uh, perspective too. So to without any delays, I would like to introduce you to our today's guest, Dr. Chaitanya Giri. Hi Chaitanya, welcome to the podcast. Munkar, it's a pleasure to connect with you and come on this very well-organized podcast, uh, Access Hub. Thanks. Thank you very much, Chaitanya. Likewise, uh, it's it's been a pleasure to have you as well because I have been, you know, trying to uh, think when to have you on the podcast. Uh, but yeah, now we have an appreciable amount of audience who will be happy to you know hear to your multidisciplinary perspectives. Uh, so yeah, glad to have you as well on the podcast. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, before taking a deep dive into the subject, Chaitanya, can you tell us a brief overview about your expertise? And I know that, you know, you come from a science background, then now you're also working on a lot of strategy management uh, related things. Uh, you're working on the security aspects as well in the space industry. So can you just tell us a briefly about your journey uh, and, you know, how you ended up in this sector? Uh, because we also have, you know, a lot of audience from the universities and the student uh, audience as well. So it will be really good to have, you know, some kind of motivation for them to uh, just have a brief overview of your journey. Sure, Omkar. Uh, I have had a long and winding journey uh, spanning across 13 years now. I've been in this sector. Uh, I started as a, a normal undergraduate like all of us. Uh, my bachelor's is in chemistry. Uh, with particular interest and concentration in analytical chemistry uh, and thereafter a master's degree in biological physics, biophysics. Uh, I got both these degrees from University of Mumbai and thereafter, like most of us, I have also been interested in space and I was quite you know, eagerly seeking opportunities to work on spacecraft instrumentation. And quite serendipitously, I came across an opportunity at the Max Planck Institute for Solar System Research, which is in Göttingen, in Germany. Uh, and uh, I was lucky to have secured that opportunity. So that opportunity was regarding uh, a payload known as Cometary Sampling and Composition Experiment. This payload was on board the European Space Agency's Rosetta mission. It was a gas chromatograph mass spectrometer and being a chemist, I was quite well versed with uh, the instrumentation type. But here for the first time, I was not working on a laboratory in instrument, not a desk instrument, but a instrument that has been heavily miniaturized. So usually gas chromatography mass spectrometry instruments, the tabletop versions are roughly around 50 kilograms. Uh, they span across of four, four and a half feet uh, when you use them in laboratories. But here we were supposed to send it to a comet, a very small comet, a comet that was four kilometers wide, that's it. And uh, the miniaturized instrument was around uh, 70 uh, centimeters in length and around 45 centimeters in width. And its mass was hardly four, four and a half kilograms. So a heavily miniaturized uh, uh, version of it, a prototype of it was residing in Max Planck Institute. While the flight instrument was already on its uh, way, it was en route to Comet 67P Churyumo Gerasimenko. So during my PhD, I was uh, given the task of optimizing and calibrating the, the flight spare model, which was at the German Institute. While I secured my PhD from University of Nice, Sofia Antipolis, which is now called as the Azure Coast University. Uh, it's in the same city, Nice, south of France, beautiful place. And I was blessed with really good professors. Having worked on space mission gave me a, quite a comprehensive view, not only on the scientific aspects of such missions, but also how international teams cooperate and collaborate with each other uh, 
where they you know sort of solve their differences where do they converge when they have similar penchants and likings so i learned a lot in those 5 6 years thereafter i moved on for my postdoc uh, on the same mission by that time the spacecraft was landing uh, on the comet uh, i finished my phd in 2 uh, years 11 months and uh, finished in september 2014 and uh, the spacecraft was about to land on the comet in november 2014 so so during those that particular year between November, September 2014 and uh, November 2015, I was a postdoc at the same place. We published some fantastic papers out of it. Uh, we discovered uh, quite a few organic molecules on the surface of the comet, which were native to the comet, um, of which there were four molecules that were never detected before. Uh, and uh, most of the molecules that we I, could identify have a role to play in origin of life. Uh, here on earth because it is uh, it is said that life on earth has emerged not only because of how the earth is constituted but uh, the deliveries that has happened via asteroids and comets uh, have played an equally important role especially in a period known as the late heavy bombardment so this happened somewhere around 4 billion years ago and that was the time uh, when a lot of geobiologists uh, suggest that life arose on Earth. So, uh, cometary exploration brought an immense value. Uh, many of the instruments uh, that were on that mission eventually got spun off. Uh, some of these instruments are right now in their spin-off fashion are working on, are operational on nuclear submarines. Uh, some of them have gone on to become heritage instruments. So, the instrument that I worked on, COSAC, uh, is now the predecessor of another instrument called Mars Organic Molecule Analyzer, uh, which is on board the ExoMars mission of European Space Agency. So a lot of heritage has gone into the industry. Some of it has continued as a space uh, heritage for subsequent missions. So there was a lot to learn. Thereafter, I moved to JAXA, uh, uh, not exactly JAXA, but I was associated with the Earth Life Science Institute at Tokyo Institute of Technology. And uh, that was an interesting uh, experience where I was able to spend a year in Japan, another year in the US. And uh, in those five, six years in the field, I was able to identify collaborators. So in Japan, I sort of aligned my postdoctoral research with the Hayabusa 2 mission, whereas in the US, I aligned it with the OSIRIS-REx mission. Now, you would ask me what is the commonality between the two missions? Uh, the only common factor is that both are asteroid sample return missions. So okay. uh, I was working on asteroids, the asteroidal chemistry, especially the refractory parts, the carbon materials that are embedded within uh, any asteroid. So uh, again, that was an exciting experience. It kept me traveling oh, the entire span of two years, made really good friends, published some uh, nice papers. Uh, we were able to identify graphene, graphene, which is of immense importance uh, these days. Uh, it is touted as the next uh, semiconductor material uh, after silicon. So we identified nanoscale graphene in a few meteorites. And uh, that in itself was a great detection for us. And that discovery made news. Uh, in uh, space media as well as chemistry media. And uh, I finished that tenure in 2018. Thereafter, I've returned to India. So I'm in India since 2018, uh, beginning of 2018. And I thought that uh, let me now switch gears and move on to policy and strategy analysis. And since then, I've been working in Indian think tanks. I've been working with Indian academia. I'm working closely with the government, the space agency, and uh, I'm putting all that I know, all that I have learned in the early years, and I'm still learning for a greater cause, and that is the growth of the Indian space program. Amazing. It's it's a fabulous journey, I would say, because it's it's not really easy to jump from one sector to another. And as you mentioned about the origin of life, so I'd like to pinpoint one thing. 
So I did one brief project during my bachelor's on panspermia theory uh, by taking a reference of lonar crater, which is the only, uh, I think, uh, crater which has, you know, alkaline water in it. Uh, it's it's in Maharashtra in a, a nearby city called as Aurangabad, I think. It's so nearby Latur, I would say, not exactly Aurangabad. So it's it's kind of interesting, you know, uh, how we meet the people from the same background and it's extensive to consume, you know, your journey. And I'm pretty sure the podcast episode that we are going to, the topics that we are going to discuss in this episode uh, is going to be much more inspirational, motivational for the students as well. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So without any delay, let's jump into the topic, uh, you know, regarding the multilateralism firstly. So as we have the audience from the space industry, uh, possibly, you know, the space industry audience uh, that we have on the podcast uh, is mainly from the science and technology background. So that's the reason I'm asking this a very basic question before taking a full deep dive into the topic. Like, what is multilateralism and why is it important for the space industry? Yeah, I wouldn't want to appear too eclectic and intellectual by defining multilateralism. Uh, I have been a very you know, simple person, I've come from a really humble background. And the opportunity that I got while I worked on Rosetta, you know, that was my first experience on multilateralism. Uh, I was working with a Europe with the European Space Agency. You know, it's a conglomerate of several uh, national space agencies in Europe. They work in unison, they work with each other, they identify yes. a cause. Uh, and I was not only working with the agency, but also on a mission that was fairly international. So there was not only participation from within Europe, but also from Russia, Japan, China, uh, United States, Canada, a uh, few countries in uh, South America, Africa, Australia. Uh, so I saw multilateralism for those five, six years. As I said, I then was traveling between the US and Japan and being an Indian with an Indian passport, I was doing all that. Yes. So uh, I have been a beneficiary and I'm the biggest champion of multilateralism uh, is what I feel uh, in my heart, at least. <laughs> I <Yes>. can't <laughs> in any other way, but I, I, I feel for it uh, for the very reason that, uh, look, uh, based on idealism, Multilateral, uh, multilateralism is the way to go because uh, when it comes to space, spaces are common human destiny. So it, it yes. cannot be dictated by one country or a few capable countries. Uh, it has to take everybody along uh, with it. Uh, you know, when I started in Europe, that was the time when, here, at least here in India, people used to cribble about why do India need to go to the moon? Why should India go to Mars? Uh, you have toilets to... <laughs> you, have, you have so yes. many liabilities. You have so many responsibilities. No, no, this is not the way to go. And that is when I started countering the fact that, look, if you employ space technologies wisely and outside the space sector when it comes to governance, if the governance uh, takes care of uh, itself, it manages itself well, then all these questions need not arise. So I started uh, advocating for greater use of uh, space technologies for socioeconomic applications. ISRO has been doing that for quite some time uh, since its inception, but we never initiated space exploration from that point, in, uh, point of view. Even if you look at what Vikram Sarabhai had to say, say uh, and those who don't know Vikram Sarabhai, he was, uh, he's considered as the, uh, the father of the Indian uh, space program. So he was the one who uh, gave it a boost in a big way. So when he was asked to put across a vision and mission statement, uh, he said something like this. Uh, I'm not quoting him precisely, but he said that we do not have the fancy of competing with advanced nation when it comes to space flight and exploration. Uh, whereas uh, when it comes to uh, space applications, India will be second to none in the world. So yes, statement of his rang bell, it resonated with every Indian. And when he made that statement, Indian economy was actually not doing well. 
but eventually uh, and uh, if you look at uh, india today india is amongst the top 5 economies of the world we are heading on to become the third largest economy on the planet and what he said back then uh, now needs to be amended i won't say that we should not uh, or we should discard or disregard uh, socio economic applications but what i say is space exploration uh, can be a mechanism through which uh, we can solve a lot of problems here if we design the missions in the right way if we design the instruments in the right way yes. uh, so and and such understanding such comprehension would not come by working in one country you have to have mobility um and i'm 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 i have always told you in our interactions that i'm very proud that you are pursuing space journalism being an indian citizen sitting in france you know yes. the the insights that you get from sitting somewhere else uh and sitting on a certain vantage point and offering yes. that analysis to the entire community you know that is something that is needed you know people like us you and i who are into the policy and uh, think tanking and consulting sector our job is uh, not to run industries but give these industries the insights from wherever we are sitting so yes. we are sort of uh, the shamans of uh, this yes. era we, we we i won't say gurus because i wouldn't want yes. to neither you and i on a pedestal uh, but but we are the shamans and we have a role to play we are the messengers yes. we are the harbingers of uh, certain messages so yes. um, and such messaging can only happen in the greater global good uh, when we have international connects and that's why i say uh, space let it be uh, the area or the arena where the countries uh, cooperate and not just compete with each other yes exactly that's that's a really great point as you mentioned it should be a point of cooperation sharing the knowledge uh, but as we see like there have been some you know divisions and factions because of, because the terrestrial conflicts are affecting i think at the moment uh, but on, uh, i think before 2022 iss was an excellent example of two states united states and russia with no common interest still cooperating you know at the international space uh, station and i think that was one of the solid example like how space can be you know uh, a medium for the nations to cooperate but unfortunately of course after the russia ukraine war things have not been so great on the international space cooperation level uh, but yeah on the same lines you know uh, we'll be taking a look at the indo pacific region like the indo pacific region has recently become the highlight in global affairs so can you give us a brief context of the region both in terms of geopolitics and satellite communication as well so umkar indo pacific is not today's uh, phenomenon it has always been like that our nomenclature our understanding of this region earlier uh, yes. was uh, based on a western construct uh, and when i say western construct what i mean is uh, the post colonial construct when the colonies had already been liberated uh, the colonizers went back yes. to uh, fully uh, and uh, this is post second world war and the region was left into uh, turmoil and to fend for itself so you saw a lot of uh, co colonies getting liberated after the second world war uh, when uh, european economy fell uh, considerably Uh, for the wars that it had initiated yes and um, that was the time when uh, west asia was called as middle east uh, india was or the region where we are the indian subcontinent we were called as uh, um, uh, south asia if you go to southeast asia they were for a pretty long time called as the far east oh okay yeah so but was it far east for us in india no it was yeah. it was much closer to us than what europe is geographically yes. uh, and in terms of also the distances that it takes uh, or the time that it takes to cover the aerial distance for travel 
so you can reach singapore you can reach vietnam within you know four to five hours from let's say delhi but uh, it takes some seven to eight hours to reach your uh, either paris or uh, london so yes. or uh, us it wasn't uh, far east but since uh, uh, none of the countries in asia were economically uh, healthy enough uh, we couldn't counter that narrative the rise of china the rise of india and yes. the relative stability that has emerged in the asean region uh, has been uh, responsible for the change in nomenclature uh, yes and a region that was called as the asia pacific uh, was you know later yes. on renamed as indo pacific now that was thanks to the japanese um thanks to prime minister shinzo abe who put across this construct now why did he do that yes. look at look at the 1990s japanese economy was uh, among the topmost in the world it, it still is today but it yes. reached its peak it peaked around 1990s and uh, that was the time when uh, japan was one of the biggest manufacturers china wasn't china was still rising and it saw uh, the entire trade route so emerging from yokohama port of yokohama going into uh, the south china sea going into the malacca straits uh, as very vital for the exports of its uh, manufactured goods so that at that point in time electronics was the biggest exports coming uh, from japan and it was the biggest exporter of its sort okay even the china took over uh, because of sound internal policies with some assistance from the united states and uh, thereafter uh, the importance of the entire trade route from uh, east china sea south china sea uh, malacca strait you know it sort of uh, was reaffirmed because this entire shipping line became important for anybody who was trading goods coming from asia east asia and yes. east asian uh, countries uh, the oil and gas coming from west asia also yes. went by route so this is how the the shipping routes sort of determined that uh, the the two oceans the two big water bodies become very important the 9 degree channel that uh, passes through the indian ocean very close to the indian waters uh, yeah even in the biggest shipping uh, lanes of the world uh, somehow at some point in time in the past 20 years it surpassed the trans atlantic trade and yes india too began realizing that a rising india has to eventually become a manufacturing base uh, it can't continue as a trader it can't continue as an agrarian country or a service provider country and uh, when india made up its mind along with japan it started uh, changing the nomenclature from asia pacific to indo pacific so in my understanding asia pacific and indo pacific are not antithetical to each other they are not opposing terms they are actually the same terms but uh, when when india and japan sees indo pacific it pers- it sees it from the point of view of maritime trade and assistance ex- uh, extending assistance to the very many island countries that reside in these two oceans whereas for china and russia who even today insists for the using the term asia pacific both these countries remember are uh, are emphasizing on terrestrial trade which is coming out of the one belt one road initiative of china and for russia yeah. is the oil and gas that comes from or the minerals that come from siberia into uh, western europe or oil and gas coming from siberia uh, or from the five stans into uh, western europe via turkey so that's the only difference otherwise i don't see any difference between indo pacific and uh, asia pacific now coming to the second yes. element i'll wind up that part quickly uh, see there are many scattered countries in uh, scattered as islands in the both these oceans so their development yes. are quite high uh, take for instance the french uh, islands 
in western pacific uh, they need yes. develop they need assistance every now and then uh, the united nations classify them as small island development states developing states they are small islands they do not have natural resources per se do not have vast territories uh, that they can exploit uh, yes. or for resources nor do they have large populations who can offer uh, a, a value to the global economy but that does not reduce their importance or their significance and the safety of these countries or the well being of these countries is very important same is the case in the indian ocean look at seychelles comoros uh, yes. madagascar you had a terrible uh, drought in madagascar and the amount of uh, you know assistance that madagascar need just a few years ago two three years ago was phenomenal so despite being a fairly large island state it couldn't fend for itself it needed assistance coming in from not only from the west but uh, i was happy enough to see that india was providing you know a lot of grains uh, potable water for them to drink uh, make sure medicines are supplied and make sure that uh, the internal security within the country does not face turmoil uh, then yes. you saw the example of the volcanic eruption in tonga yeah very recently this year early this yes. year Tonga was completely disconnected uh, after the eruption, and there was no way uh, the world could uh, sort of fathom or connect with uh, the number of lives lost. Uh, we were unable to provide immediate relief and uh, rescue uh, and disaster, uh, you know, relief to fellow Tongans. And in such scenarios, and these countries are they are. They are far and wide they are deep into the oceans yes uh, providing them any assistance becomes very difficult and time consuming especially in such scenarios when lives are at stake so yes. to reach out to these countries it is very important that whenever a crisis happens over time a crisis that gradually happens like droughts of madagascar or a sudden crisis like the volcanic eruption of tonga what we need is yes your lines of communications with them and yes. that's where the role of satcom comes into place yes definitely i think the point that you mentioned about you know giving a full context to it i was expecting this answer from you and definitely you you know presented it in a really amazing way satellite communication the reason why i would like to tell to audience why satellite communication why not terrestrial or fiber is because erecting a terrestrial infrastructure is way too costly and it can be disrupted on and off again and again uh, due to the, you know the conditions on the island but satellite communications you know it's you just put up a terminal and you get the signal like there is there is no middle wiring or any kind of infrastructure involved in it so that's the reason like satellite communication is the most preferred mode of communication uh, especially in the remote areas and the remote islands as well so chaitanya yeah, uh, proceeding ahead into the topic i would like to know I, i mean you already mentioned the challenges and opportunities so i would like to know from the political leadership perspective and how does it impact the development and regulation of satellite communication infrastructure in the indo pacific so ungar um, to be very frank uh, i'll tell you that india for a very long time did not have a vision beyond the indian oceans uh, as recent as the uh, yes. 2010s uh, we were told that the indian navy is a net security provider net security and assistance provider for the entire indian ocean region right from uh, simon's town in south africa which is the hub of the south african navy to perth in western australia so we was we had somewhat have confined ourselves to the indian ocean that we shouldn't be looking beyond that uh, but the growing stature the growing security yes. of india uh, uh, and when i say security the maritime trade security because you know a population like ours which is manufacturing heavily has to trade with countries based in latin america in south america central america uh, western coast yes. of africa uh, we have to trade with uh, uh, you know the, like i said the island countries uh, in the pacific 
Yes. So secure these lines of communications or lines of trade. Uh, it was imperative for us to look beyond the Indian Ocean. So Indian Ocean remains to be our uh, our main area of operations. As well as the security in Indian Ocean also was a great responsibility for ours. Uh, yes. The water in the Western Arabian Sea, uh, somewhere uh, along the coast of Aden, in Yemen, along Djibouti, these were infested with uh, they were infested with uh, the pirates. There was heavy piracy in this in those waters. So yes. the first thing that we did was with uh, friendly countries was to make sure that the piracy uh, is checked very well because it was directly yes. affected. Was, uh, so we got assistance from European navies, uh, the US Navy, which is present in the Indian Ocean. Uh, uh, we got assistance from the uh, navies of the Arab world uh, as well as Iran to an extent. Uh, and we put a check to uh, piracy there. But thereafter, we sort of uh, expanded our ambits. And thanks to, uh, again, I'll uh, acknowledge uh, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, who set yes. that ball rolling. And uh, the previous government, uh, that of uh, Prime Minister Manmohan Singh, gave uh, Shinzo Abe the pedestal. So the thought of Indo-Pacific was made from nowhere but the Indian Parliament. It came from the speech that he made in the Indian Parliament. So I see that event, that small event, uh, as a major, major turning point in the way India observes the planet. Yeah. And uh, what we are trying to do now you know, 2007, after 2007, what it's been, what, 15 years now, 15, 16 years. We are now at a stage, yes. we are ready to partner with all friendly countries. Uh, and we are also eager to cooperate with countries with whom we do not share as warm relations to make sure yes. that the Pacific remains safe. Uh, and uh, there's no conflict and contestation. And uh, Everybody uh, or all countries uh, work with each other uh, in unison and yes. does not lead to any acrimonious situation. So when it comes yes. to SACOM, uh, we have recently expanded our uh, uh, satellite navigation services or built our satellite navigation services, if not expanded. And uh, we are ready to provide these satellite services uh, in these waters. Yes. Second, Secondly, uh, we are also attempting to provide uh, earth observation services so that fishing appears uh, or fishing happens uh, in, a, in a judicious manner. There are countries in our region, there are countries in our region that are uh, sending fishing militias into deep waters. So uh, thousands of kilometers away from their main coastline. So we want yes. to make sure that all island countries uh, uh, and their fishing stock uh, or no other navy or fishing militias come to their waters and uh, exploit their resources, resources that are attributed to them, resources that are their rights. So uh, yes. we are working with all friends. Um, today, uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi is in France. Uh, he is there celebrating the French uh, Bastille Day. And uh, with the French, we have great cooperation. We share common interest in the Indo-Pacific. And likewise, we share common interest with uh, countries of Quad, with uh, countries in the ASEAN region, uh, with countries that are part of the IORA region, uh, IORA Association, Indian Ocean Rim Association. And uh, India has also friendly relations with countries in the Arab world uh, along the Red Sea, uh, along the Suez Belt, uh, yes. and uh, Eastern Seaboard of Africa. So we really don't yeah. uh, yeah. animosity or enemies anywhere, but we are wanting to make sure that a certain order is created and maintained. Yes. I think this is an extensive explanation about uh, the ambition that India has been having since the push that Shinzo Abe gave towards the Quad. 
like enhancing the cooperation between the countries which which possibly don't have common geopolitical interests or you know didn't have possibly in the past any common interests but are now you know getting closer and cooperating on several issues so on the same lines i would like to just also highlight that recently uh, three of the quad members that is uh, india japan and australia they also initiated a thing called as a resilient supply chain initiative rsci that is called and i believe uh, currently it is it is actually initiated to counter the chinese interference in the indo pacific region uh, primarily you know the things that australia especially faced in the solomon islands uh, and you know depend to cut off the dependence possibly of australia on china so how do you see this landscape evolving the rsci landscape evolving and its implication on the space sector like will resilient supply chain initiative also have some effects on the space and defense supply chain in the indo pacific region uh, it will have a great uh, impact so there is also something known as the critical minerals initiative that has been created to make sure that whatever export controls that china is implementing now for our audience uh, i must say that china is blessed with a really good geology yes and uh, it is blessed with tremendous natural resources uh, that it exploits with impunity uh, and why i say that is because a lot of these resources that come out of uh, let's say inner mongolia or or uh, the tarim basin of china or tibet uh, would not have been exploited as china has had china been a democracy so a lot yes. of resources that emerge out of china are coming out uh, with no consideration for the environment or for or for human rights so exploiting critical minerals uh, is actually a dirty game uh, it yes. is not a process and we have all known about it i'm i'm not the first person to speak about it uh, we see that also happening in uh, africa and the lessons that are learned from uh, rare earth mineral exploitations in africa uh, are testimony enough to suggest what could be happening in china because uh, what china does remains shrouded uh, behind the the great wall that it has created that does not allow us to see uh, what exactly happens when it comes to environment rights or human rights yes uh, but then again uh, i must also point to the fact that how far can the world go with consumerism it is the consumerism yes. uh, that has come out of uh, the us the great american dream that they once sold to the world uh, uh, which is highly consumeristic in nature uh, today if you look at the, the united states or canada uh, the per capita emissions are humongous uh, in that region uh, yes uh, take for instance you come from you live in europe uh, you see the quality of public transport in europe and see the quality of public transport in north america uh, yes that that is a given that gives away a lot so yeah. people in north america have been quite consumerist in nature and uh, that consumerism when it started creating problem in their own lands they exported mining they exported manufacturing to china so what is china doing right now it is not only exploiting its own natural resources for the world but uh, it is also manufacturing for the world and not for the world's needs but for the world's greed as yes. mahatma gandhi has put out so so we are, we have become too consumerist we have become too market type and this is the reason why uh, rare earth mining or critical minerals exploitation has become a major problem uh, what yes. i think is uh, china will continue to hold a strangle hold Uh, on these supply chains it has put tremendous export controls on uh, uh, the exports of such minerals uh, more recently just a week or 10 days ago it put an export control on gallium and germanium 
which are which are very crucial for uh, manufacturing of uh, high end electronics and with such export controls none of the countries can right now think of replacing or creating new alternative supply chains mining in china is cheap because there is environmental disregard or disregard for human rights but uh, will it be as cheap in australia will it be as cheap in north america i don't think so so there will be a tremendous yes. cost to it so eventually True. what we can compel the world is to look out for uh, cleaner alternatives even for critical minerals so yes. one promising thing that is coming on the scene is uh, that uh, sodium sodium ion battery or potassium ion battery is seen as the successor to lithium ion battery uh, sodium and potassium are present almost everywhere it can be easily yes. uh, it can be easily extracted from the earth and it does not cause as great environmental harm as a lithium mining would so we yes. will have to come out with certain uh, these kind of alternatives and i am of the belief that uh in this contestation between united states and its partners with china or with russia there is no sane voice coming out of it i am expecting some yes. sanction from europe i am expecting a greater uh, uh leadership thought leadership coming from india yes as we face the challenge of uh, you know curtailed supply chains so yes. uh, i i'm not i'm not uh, sure whether the quad or the critical minerals initiative will be able to come up with a solution uh, you have a china with a complete strangle hold on reis globally yes uh, and then you have 13 countries uh, who may not see eye to eye with each other so yes between the two uh, china wins uh, you know Yes. Yeah, I believe this allocation of resources and investment—it's something. It it also needs to have the sustainability perspective embraced within, as you mentioned. Like it's a dirty work. Uh, it's not. It's not something that is you know very clean, uh, because it affects a lot. Of, it's not. It not only affects the uh, human health, but also the environmental factors also come into the play. So. with respect to this only what are the potential future trends and developments uh, in multilateral cooperation and political leadership influencing the satellite communication landscape in the indo pacific like how do you view this whole scenario from your perspective so in the indo pacific uh, see the indo pacific is not a environmentally stable zone firstly yes. most of the low lying islands have been complaining about uh, climate change rise of sea water levels and yes. uh, more erratic weather patterns so intense storms uh, and so on and so forth so that has been troubling them and that affect not only their economy but also their livelihoods so it is a major issue that is coming up so uh, climate change uh, has become a, a sort of a reason why we need a greater satcom connectivity with these uh, countries number yes. two is that um, again many islands are located alongside the pacific ring of fire which is this yes. belt uh, belt of volcanoes and you know highly tectonic uh, tectonically active Uh, zone that uh, starts from the andaman nicobar islands of india uh, it passes to yes. indonesia it goes into malaysia philippines up north uh, uh, east of taiwan into japan up north into kamchatka uh, peninsula of russia then it goes into alaska then it go comes down to british columbia of canada uh, upstate washington california then it goes down south into mexico and then down into south america all the south american countries so ecuador yes. uh chile and what not so this entire horseshoe region is affected by uh, uh persistent volcanic activities earthquakes and uh, yes. such a situation 
becomes uh, a vital asset uh, when it comes to not only monitoring of disasters but also ensuring that uh, livelihoods that are at stake that are uh, that are at stake uh, they they are sort of saved well in time so disaster mitigation preparedness and management uh, becomes one of the foremost uh, uh, issues uh, that satcom can easily address and when we say disasters uh, we are talking about both uh, ge geological and geophysical disasters and also climate change related uh, challenges and disasters so yes. uh, the, that is uh, needed again uh, Tele-education and telemedicine. This is something that India has been really proud of. Uh, it has offered uh, these kind of services to its own people within the country. And India is confident that tele-education and telemedicine could be also offered to remote islands uh, within the Indo-Pacific. Now, yes. I'm also I'm not only talking about islands, I'm talking about the great many uh, container ships, logistic ships. Uh, that ply these waters. Whenever there is an issue, wherever there is a conflict, whenever there is a breakdown of certain ship ship lanes, SATCOM again will play an important role. And uh, yes. there is a word that is quite often used in the Indian political uh, scene. That word is called Antyodaya. And Antyodaya means uh, benefit of the last person standing reaching out to the last person standing in the queue. So, uh, SATCOM could be one of the greatest technological platforms that could benefit uh, both during peacetime, during conflict time, during crisis, and even when things are nice and quiet. Yes. Definitely, I think... This is something that uh, we all are looking forward to, uh, to have some more developments about uh, satellite communication. And as we discussed in the previous questions as well, uh, space is one of the intersection point where countries with no common interests can possibly you know, collaborate and cooperate because a lot of science is involved in this. Uh, but of course, unfortunately, the, the terrestrial conflicts are also not are now getting involved uh, in the space industry, which is why there is a rift that we are observing. But hopefully, let's let's hope for the best uh, for this region where countries like India will be playing a prime role. And I think uh, United States also looks towards India as a prime security navigator for the for this region. I mean, if they really want to uh, possibly cast a wide net, uh, India is possibly the only country. I mean, the only democratic biggest democracy in this region that we can say so i think we are uh, getting to the end of the podcast now and this final question is for the students uh, i mean i know that you know you explained your journey uh, in the beginning of the episode uh, but still i would like to know what message you would like to give to the students stepping into the field of space technology defense and security research studies so, Ongar, I mean, that's very nice of you that you are thinking about students and uh, uh, you know asking guests on your post podcast about uh, their views that they could share for students. You know, this is very important. You know, had yes. I gone 15 years late, I would have been one of the beneficiaries of uh, your podcast. Uh, <laughs> back in yes. those days, there was no such podcast uh, and uh, there was valuable information was difficult to acquire, at least for students. Yes. What I suggest students is keep their eyes and ears open, um, get their basic education sorted from universities and colleges, uh, identify uh, what they really like to do. You know, very important to be passionate about what you are doing, you know, uh, because that passion is one of the key drivers of their commitment to not only their careers, but also to the larger goal that the careers might spin off into. So be open, be uh, keep your eyes and ears open. Always be hands on. Uh, this is what I say. Uh, you know, in the in these times of podcast and you know YouTube channels and uh, uh, and you know straight away access to writing what's there on your mind in terms of social media posts, 
Facebook posts or Twitter posts, it is very easy to profess. But what will give you the authority in the society or in the community is your hands-on expertise. So if you have hands-on expertise in certain areas, uh, uh, like like my friend Omkar is a journalist, but a yeah. journalist with a scientific background. You know, we need such kind of people to come up. You know, a journalist who writes on science, works on space, uh, but from a science standpoint, we need such people. Yes. So make sure that you have, you know, uh, transdisciplinary interests uh, where you are being the bridge between two or three domains. And this is how you will uh, heighten your value and your contributions to the uh, community uh, and we need more committed people we need more humble people uh, we need people who would who would be here for a longer run and not for short term glories yes <laughs> that's true yeah and um, you know life will take you far and wide so that's my message to all the students thank you very much Chaitan it's a great message I hope uh, students take away a lot of uh, key things for their career and for the future as well uh, from this episode so yeah thank you very much again and we really hope we record some more future episodes again because there were several questions that came up i think especially related to the quad we can possibly create a dedicated episode in the future as the developments go ahead so yeah thank you very much again it was great to have you on the podcast thank you Umkar. i'll definitely join your next podcast <laughs>